I'm best known as an Arab Spring activist. I became uh, known uh, in early 2011. Uh, in, in the immediate aftermath of the Arab Spring, I was mostly, uh, my activities were mostly online. And uh, I, I basically became quite popular online uh, as time went on. And I think it peaked around uh, 2013 after the coup in Egypt, when I think uh, I, I became the most, uh, the, most inf the most influential social media account in the, in the United Arab Emirates, where I resided. Uh, of course, I lived all my life in the United Arab Emirates, although uh, I'm not a citizen, I'm officially stateless. And uh, I guess things came to a head in around, uh, I think it was in April 2014, when I was uh, summoned to uh, a police station and told uh, very briefly and very professionally that I'm being exiled, I'm being expelled from the country. Um, of course, uh, keeping in mind, that's the only country I've ever lived in all my life. Uh, so I ended up in jail for uh, for a while, and then I lived in Kuala Lumpur Airport for a while, and then eventually made my way to Norway, where I I was granted political asylum, and where I live. I mean I'm I mean I live in Norway, but I have to divide my time between Norway and Kuala Lumpur for family uh, you know for family reasons for, because of some complications. Uh, I'm currently writing a book about my experiences. I'm actually writing a book. I was writing a book before that about the Arab Spring. Uh, I'm also interested in, uh, in radicalization and liberalization within the Islamic context. I was legally a refugee even before I was expelled, because I, uh, all my life I carried a refugee's travel document issued by Egypt. Uh, so, but, but uh, you know, legally speaking, I had a home. I, I lived in, in, basically, I was born and raised uh, in, in the Gulf. Uh, but I kind of was sent back into statelessness and sent back into, into the refugee status after my expulsion. There are pretty radical topics in the United Arab Emirates, especially if you're talking about it in public, and especially if you are not only talking about I mean, of course, you can talk about these things in theory, but once uh, it comes down to actually talking practical steps and talking about solutions and criticizing governments, uh, and, you know, talking about what the government is not doing and what the government is doing, uh, you know, something like that makes you, uh, puts you in a very, very, uh, it puts you on a clash, on a path, on a path of clash with the government. And eventually, sooner or later, they will move against you. Um, although I should add that I was not critical of the UAE government. I became, I was critical of the UAE's, UAE government's foreign policy. So I mainly got in trouble, not because I criticized the UAE's own government, but because I, I criticized the Egyptian government, which is funded and backed by, uh, by the Emirati government. Well, IS, uh, ISIS is actually the antithesis of the Arab Spring. It basically represents the opposite ideal, but for the same set of promises. Uh, you know, when we talked about the Arab Spring, when we when we go and talk to people, uh, I mean, when we talk to people who are protesting or were protesting, what they mention the most is dignity. What, why are we protesting? Because we demand dignity, and they define dignity in different ways. Uh, there, there, there's, there's, there's always the, the, what you, what you hear is things like uh, uh, liberty, uh, independence, uh, uh, being heard. And uh, ISIS, in a sense, offers the same, it promises the same thing, but kind of in a zombie kind of world. Uh, it, it kind of, off, it kind of uh, you know, tries to uh, answer the same aspirations, but of course in a very, very different direction. Uh, so in a sense, it is the antithesis, it is the competing vision to the Arab Spring. It's the competing ideology to the Arab Spring. Now, we did not expect it uh, because the idea, I mean, the, the significance of the Arab Spring was that it shattered the idea of violence, the idea that you cannot achieve change non-violently. This, this was an idea that was pretty much, you know, uh, entrenched before the Arab Spring. And when the, Arab, you know, when the Tunisian Revolution uh, succeeded and then the Egyptian Revolution succeeded, uh, and then, you know, by May, when Bin Laden, Bin Laden was killed in May 2011, by then the idea of violence had taken a very sharp hit. 
jihadism was at a low point, and it was the Syrian crisis that rejuvenated this fossil. It was already a fossil, and it was really rejuvenated. The, the idea of violence was re-implanted by you know the world's inaction towards Syria. Well, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say there's a lot there's big support. I mean, I would be careful about that. Uh, IS is not mainstream by by any chance, and it's already a, it's a it's a project doomed to failure already because it's been rejected by the vast by the vast majority of Muslims worldwide. IS is a product of failure. It only it's you know basically it's only spreading because of a lack of political will and a lack of uh, you know uh, international uh, ability to cope with it. So I wouldn't say that it has a lot of support. It has a lot of success strategically speaking, uh, and because of the, uh, you know, the, the, the anarchy situation, the state, basically the, the, the lack of any state in that area. But I would be careful about, uh, you know, saying that it's mainstream or it's basically has a lot of support because it doesn't. Uh, I'm not worried about it ideologically speaking. Uh, I'm worried about it. It's a security threat. Uh, and it's, uh, what do you say? Uh, it's definitely a, uh, a terrorism threat. But it's not an ideological threat. It's not sustainable. The idea is that the uh, the word citizenship is heavily politicized in the Arab world, generally speaking, but especially in the Gulf. Uh, these countries do not have the same uh, conception of a state. Uh, it's not exactly a nation state. It's more of a rentier state which means that the, the, the relationship between the government and the citizens is lopsided. Instead of the government, basically in, in, in Europe, let's say, it is the people who pay taxes to the government, and that comes with some form of representation. In, in uh, the Gulf states, in most of the Gulf states, it's the reverse, because it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's basically uh, uh, a government which whose uh, income comes mainly from uh, resources from you know from the, from oil uh, so it is the one that pays people uh, and this this is compounded by the fact that you have a demographic imbalance like for example in the United Arab Emirates where I where I where I originally came from um, uh, twelve percent of the population only are citizens eighty eight percent are non citizens uh, so they're always afraid of taking in uh, additional non-citizens. Of course, this is not an excuse. I'm not saying this is an excuse because uh, uh, the, the, these Im imbalances and these, you know, these kind of uh, situations have to be resolved because these, uh, if you continue up down this path, what you have is really a very unsustainable kind of uh, political situation, not demographic situation and social situation, and even economic situation. Uh, but the fact is that Unfortunately, many of these governments respond to crisis rather than think strategically. And this is what makes them incapable of uh, handling uh, uh, such a crisis. Uh, I think it's unconscionable. Uh, in fact, uh, some of the refugees I personally met uh, in, uh, in Norway, and I remember this very clearly because I was actually taking a walk with them in a very, it was a very cold day, it was in December. And uh, one of them just broke out and said, uh, you know, why, what are we doing in Norway? Mecca was closed, Dubai was closed, Cairo was closed. Why are we in Norway? They, they're not happy to be, to be in Europe uh, rather than uh, in an Arab country. If, if, they, if it was possible to actually have a peaceful and you know, prosperous uh, and secure life in an Arab country, they wouldn't come to Europe. It's not an option, of course, but you know, it just uh, it at that moment itself, it felt very surreal that three Arab guys who have never uh, experienced this kind of extra. Of course, uh, keep in mind that we come from very hot countries, and we're we're and we're walking in you know in the interiors of uh, in, basically near the Swedish border, uh, in you know in quite severe weather. And uh, it just felt severe that, uh, sorry, it felt surreal that, you know, three Arab guys are walking down this icy road in Norway. Uh, it just, at, at some moment, you just wonder, what are we doing here? Uh, this is a moment that all refugees come, you know, uh, 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 it, it comes to many refugees. And it's not, it's not unusual. When I spoke to other people, 
they're like, you know, yeah, we, we actually have these moments where we just wonder, what are we doing here? We feel very disoriented. I really doubt it because, because it would be, taking in refugees would be, would mean not just, I mean, let's, let's define what it means to take in refugees. Taking in refugees does not mean simply allowing them to cross over and live in a, in a, in a refugee camp. Uh, that is not what I consider to, to be taking in refugees. This is, you know, when 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 uh, when refugees cross over on foot and uh, they're fleeing war, uh, you have to provide them at least with somewhere to stay and some some you know some sustenance. Uh, but that is not cons that's not what I mean by uh, taking in refugees. I mean providing them with a permanent, providing them with a chance to build a new life because they lost a previous life. Refugees who are running away or have been, you know, uh, uh, what do you say, uh, expelled, they lost a formal life and they need to build a new life. You cannot build a new life on a, on a, on a what do you say, on a refugee camp. And this is why, I mean, this is why they're fleeing, for example, from Turkey and Jordan, uh, Jordan and, and even in Lebanon, where they actually have uh, a lot of refugees. They have, they are taking in a lot of refugees, but you cannot build a life. Uh, you know, uh, living on a refugee camp with no uh, work permits and no legal status. Uh, so let's define that first as taking in refugees. When we say we expect these countries to take in refugees, we don't mean that we want them to build a refugee camp city and put them there. We, we mean that we want them to provide them with a chance to build a new life, uh, allow them to reside in the country legally, provide them with protection, uh, allow them to work, allow them to, uh, what do you say, uh, educate their children, etc. Uh, and I really doubt that those countries will do that because that would be extremely disruptive to their political and social status quo. Uh, these are very fragile countries. They, they might look ferocious, but they're actually quite fragile.